glad you guys are here. It's good to see everybody. So we got to meet at Scissor Tail Park yesterday. It started out so cold. We had our layers and layers, as Israel was saying, within about five minutes, we were stripping off the gloves and the hats and the sun came out. And it was actually pretty amazing. It was good to see everybody. We had about 20 or so people show up and we just got to talk and hang out. So we would like to do that periodically. You know, in Oklahoma, it can go from 26 and snowy to 78 and we're swimming all the way through December to January. So we will do that as kind of spontaneous, throw out, meet us there if you want to, um, as the weather permits. Also, this Thursday coming up, I am so excited for our spooky tastic, little haunting Halloweeny path of candy, not too scary um, situation for our kids. That's going to be Thursday at six o'clock at Simplicity. We are going to have masks on. We will have hands washed, sanitized, and we will be just handing out ready-made bags. The kids will come in just a couple at a time. They'll have distance between. They will go through kind of a little maze through the building that keeps everybody spread out and receive their candy and we'll have some goodies and then next wednesday um we will start up an, our second four-week study and most likely that will be from six to seven so we'll let you know uh soon what what all the information is for that but yeah next uh not this coming wednesday but the next wednesday we'll start our, our another four-week study okay and yes it'll you can come live as long as we social distance and we have masks on, or you can zoom in uh, or watch it later, or maybe on Facebook, something like that. Thank you so much for the way you love us. Um, even when we don't feel the ability to love ourselves, you see something worthy of love in us. And I ask that you just make us, make us aware of what it is that you love in our hearts so that we can we can start loving ourselves too and so that we can love others around us as well um, in the age of zoom video calls loving your neighbor becomes so much harder um, when it's not when you're not able to give a hug immediately when you're not able to pat someone on the back or shake a hand uh, just help us to know how to love our neighbors better as well and god um, when when even worship is in song is hindered and changed in ways that we wouldn't have expected going into 2020. Help us to know how to love you better and how to engage with you and respond to you, Father, in a way that reflects the love we have for you. So God, as we, um, as we go into a time of um, reflecting on your word, I ask that you help us to, um, to really consider what love looks like today and how we can love you better, love our neighbors better, and engage in this world in a way that reflects the love you have um, for all of us, all of your children of God. In your son's name we pray. Amen. That flows perfectly into our scripture in the lectionary in the gospel today. Um, this is one of, uh, there's parts of this, elements of this uh, scripture that we're going to read together today. It's in Matthew 22, verses 34 through 46. Matthew 22, 34 through 46. We're towards the end of the gospel, and what we see here starting in chapter 21 of Matthew's gospel is this escalation uh, between Jesus and the elite leaders, uh, the Roman leaders and those elite leaders that are allied with Rome and with Caesar, which includes Pharisees, Sadducees, temple elite, uh, the chief priests and the elders of the people. So even the religious structure of, of Jerusalem and of Judaism at the time of Jesus, uh, all of the leaders were basically handpicked by Rome and uh, the Roman governors, because they would find people that would be uh, connecting to them uh, as allies. So that's, uh, that's what was going on there. So Jesus uh, escalates this uh, back and forth, and this, this uh, is kind of anti-imperial talk, right up to the point that basically they're just so f just fed up with him that they're just going to kill him right? That, and that's what happens. So we're kind of right in the middle of this escalation, chapters 21 through, oh, I can't remember, about 20, 
five or something. Uh, anyways, um, when the Pharisees, so we're starting verse 34. Let me just read through this. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they, the Pharisees, gathered together with the Sadducees. All right. So now remember, Pharisees and Sadducees were pretty much opposed to one another within their, they were different sects of the, of the, of Judaism, but they uh, had a common enemy in Jesus. So they decided to uh, gang up together so they could shut up this insurrectionist. So when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer from the Pharisees, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And he said to him, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. If you were at, with us on Wednesday night, uh, that is exactly what we were discussing Wednesday night in our, in our, uh, in our Bible study. This, is, this goes back to this famous verse uh, in Deuteronomy called the Shema. Uh, which is hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love him with all your heart, soul, and mind, right? With everything in your being. That's what nefesh means for, for soul. It doesn't just mean this ghostly thing. It, nefesh means your entire being, everything that you've got in you, every piece of DNA and, and blood, sweat, tears, everything you can feel, everything you can think, everything you can taste, with everything, with all of your ancestry, and with all of the, 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 the future of your, of your children and your children's children, right? It's like with your nefesh, with everything in you, you should love the Lord your God, right? That's the most important command. And then Jesus says, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. Everything about God and being a God person hangs on these two things, love God and love your neighbor. And we know through the gospels that our neighbor is every other person who has life, right? Any other person that is a human person is your neighbor. We, we know this through other interactions where people are asking Jesus questions like, well, who is my neighbor? right? Trying to justify, well, who is my neighbor? Because there were things around there, well, my neighbor is people who act like me, and who talk like me, and who believe like me, and who worship like me, or my neighbor is people who live in my neighborhood, and people who vote like me, and people who understand the world with a worldview that's like mine, people that have a common uh, understanding and religious viewpoints, uh, and so that's my neighbor. And so trying to justify themselves, they would ask, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus then tells the story of the great, the, of the good Samaritan, which is the idea of that the very person that you hate the most is your neighbor. Are you with me? So this is where we get the idea of, you know, every kind of bird there is, we don't, there, there is no such thing as, well, you don't have to love them because they're not like you. That's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus throughout the scripture uh, and throughout his interactions, and throughout the questions that were asked of Jesus, Jesus continually answers in ways that they don't like, that the establishment doesn't like, because it pushes their limits. It stretches them beyond what they're willing to do and what they like to do. It, it, it moves you past the status quo of just kind of going along with what works for you. Are, are you with me? Anyone? Are you listening to me? Uh, this is, this is, Jesus, he's going to go after your boundaries, and he's going to say, no, it's not just about having a God and loving a God and doing what you think it makes you good with your God, but it is also about loving your neighbor. Now, I'm calling this today Jesus in questions because this happens a lot. There's all these back and forth, and this whole interaction starts with question. What is the, what is the most important law? 
What is the most important command, Jesus? Now, it says that this lawyer asked this to test Jesus. Well, I, we don't really know necessarily what this test was. Was it a test to, you know, have him say something that, you know, the Pharisees felt another way, or would it go against a, you know, some kind of rabbinical tradition, and, and maybe he's going to say something else that other rabbis wouldn't have said? Uh, it, we don't really know. It, I, honestly, it's not a really astute test, I don't think. I mean, because it would be pretty obvious to just any Jewish person who is worth their salt at all would have probably shared the Shema, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But it, nevertheless, they were upset with Jesus, and they're asking him questions because they want to somehow find something that can get him tripped up or they can get the crowd to turn against him. And so they're asking these questions, and Jesus is answering questions. And we see this back and forth, and they're just so frustrated because everything that he says silences their questions. They have nothing that they can say. In fact, if you go on, and Jesus says, now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. So now we have, the question is not being asked to Jesus, but now Jesus is asking the question to them, which, by the way, have you ever seen, bless you, Lindsay, uh, have you ever seen, <laughs> have you ever seen um, these moments where somebody asks a question and the person that's being asked a question is like way more advanced than the person asking them, and so they'll ask the person that was asked the original question will ask a question in return and it just completely stumps, you know, the other person because they're not thinking of it in a way. And that's how Jesus was. Jesus would many times answer questions with questions. Um, in fact, I read, I don't know if you saw, does anyone here follow Jonathan Martin? I don't know if you follow Jonathan Martin. He, he put up a picture this week. He was in North Carolina, and one of his good friends is the pastor, Stephen Furtick, if you know who he is. And uh, I love this thing. When he, he wrote, Jonathan wrote this little thing about his interaction with, with Stephen Furtick. And he said, I, I love being able to be with him because we just, we connect so fast, and we talk deeply, and we get to the soul, the nefesh of the thing. You know, we don't just talk about, oh, how's the weather? How's your dog doing? You know, stuff like that. Like they really get, and there was this one line that Jonathan said in his post. And he said, Stephen asked better question than most people have answers or something to that effect. I, I'm paraphrasing, but that was the line. And I was like, oh, that's such a great line. Like his questions are better than most people's answers. See, like that's, that's when you know something is happening, when the question is so intense that it, it's, it's better than an answer, because the question is the thing that makes you think, that makes you stretch, that makes you get out of the status quo. It makes you realize that there's a world that is beyond just your own little life and your own decisions, and there's a world beyond us, and that's what Jesus constantly does with these questions. So listen to this. It says, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. He goes, what do you think of the Messiah? Right? Who's, whose son is he? And they said, well, uh, the son of David. And so Jesus said to them, well, how is it then that David, by the Spirit of God, calls the Messiah Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And Jesus says, if David calls the Messiah Lord, then how can the Messiah be his son? And listen, to I love, so that right there, by the way, is a Jonathan Martin moment. That was a better question than an answer, right? Than most people have answers. Now, you might not get this, but I, and I'll, I'll come back to it here in a minute. But look at what he says. He goes, if David then calls the Messiah Lord, how can the Messiah be David's son? If he's calling him Lord, and Lord means the all-encompassing one, right? So how could it be son? His son is not his Lord. So the Messiah might be something. Maybe when we say son of David, it doesn't really mean a biological son of David. Maybe it means something else. 
And uh, by the way, that's what Jesus is saying. One of the one of the titles, by the way, that they gave Jesus was Son of David, right? Anyone remember that in the Bible where they, where Jesus would show up at some places that they, they would say Son of David, they would call him that, right? Which was an, a recognition that the Son of David is Messiah, that the one who is called Son of David is also the one who who has uh, this power, right? Now, so he says, if David calls him Lord, then how could it, the Messiah also be his son? <clears throat> Listen to this. No one, this is one of my favorite scriptures of all the Bible. No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. <laughs> I personally, I love that because it's like, it's like, dude, just stop asking him questions. It's we're getting killed out here, right? So the Sadducees ask questions and they get blown up. The Pharisees like, all right, well, we're going to come in. Who, where's our lawyer? Where's the best lawyer? Get the lawyer in here. Hey, Jesus, what was the most important command? Well, how about this? And then how about this? It's about your neighbor. It's not just about your godliness. It's about your neighbor. It's about how you love. How you love God is how you love others. And by the way, what do you, who do you think the Messiah is? Well, I mean, it was a son of David. Well, then why would David call him, son, call him Lord if it's his son? It's like, all right, just, you know what, Sadducees, shut up. Just don't ask any more questions, all right? Just, just stop. And Sadducees are like, all right, you know what, Pharisees, you're the ones who just got made look like a fool, all right, in front of everybody, right? You're embarrassing me in front of my friends, all right? So quit it. Quit asking them questions. So now they literally have no answer for Jesus. They're, these questions are too great and too intense, and there's nowhere to go. And Jesus has shown yet again that the worldly way, that the imperial way, that the Roman way, that the Caesar way is limited, it is small-minded, it does not look out for anyone other than self, it is not interested in others, it is not interested in neighbor, and Jesus is saying your idea of Messiah and the commands and godliness are so off that you, even when I give you just plain and simple understanding of the law and the prophets, love God and love your neighbor. The Messiah is the Lord not just a biological offspring of David. When I give you these simple understandings, it's too much for you to understand. You don't want to answer the questions and you don't want to ask questions anymore because you don't want to know the answers and you don't want to stretch. You don't want to stretch your own status quo. Are you guys with me? Anyone? Raise your hand if you're with me, if you get that. See, this is, this is the idea of questions. The minute you stop asking questions is the minute you stop to grow. The minute that you don't allow the Spirit of God to question your own heart and soul is the minute that we've, we've stopped. <clears throat> so these questions, these questions have to be asked, and they have to be answered or at least we have to venture an answer even if it's not a good answer we need to try amen we need to we need to try so i think about let me just say this real fast and I, i'm going to show you a video it's a quick uh, music video and I'll, I'll set it up a little bit but it's very it's a little bit different than what i usually do but uh, it really impacted me and i want to show you this here in just a minute i'll share my screen but before i do that <clears throat> you know i look at our, i look at our culture in America. I look at Christian culture in America. And I see these things like, what is the most important, uh, what's the most important thing for a Christian voter to vote for? And I, I would dare say that most Christians would answer that is like, we've got to be pro-life. We've got to vote pro-life, which means you know, anti-abortion, right? Like we got to vote for some, and that becomes kind of like this main thing. And, 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 and you've seen this a lot, and I've seen it, but there's all these different things where people say, you know, pro-life is more than just not abortion. Like pro-life, like what if we are really loving our neighbor, then shouldn't pro-life 
include way more than just the issue of abortion? Should it not? I mean, for me, I think it should. I think that my neighbors are not just unborn babies. My neighbors are these children. Guys, there's 545 kids that don't know. We have no idea where their parents are because we separated them starting in 2018. And, and listen, I, I, listen, I know I'm getting political, but I'm not getting political. Because the bottom line is, is that, I, you know, I always hear this when somebody brings up the kids in cages, like, well, Obama started that. Okay, well, then Obama was wrong, too. Like, who do you think I am? You think I'm talking about these things and loving neighbors and not tearing children away from their parents because I'm a Democrat or an independent and not a Republican? No. You think it's because I don't like Trump? No. It's because I really believe that our neighbors are people that are also people that have tried to get into this country, even if they've tried illegally. That doesn't change the fact that they're my neighbor. And my neighbor is also someone who, who's on crack and who is homeless. My neighbor is someone who votes different than me. My neighbor is someone who doesn't have opportunity. My neighbor is someone who is, is strung out on drugs. My neighbor is someone who's an alcoholic and in addiction. My neighbor is somebody who's gay or who's lesbian or who's transitioning from one gender to a different or someone who says, no, I, I don't identify with any gender. See, I mean, my neighbor is not just the people that I like and I can tolerate. My neighbor is every human being. It's a bad question just to say, well, what's the most important thing to vote for? Because we're not one policy voters. We can't be. We have to be voting for the humanity of all human beings, not just one segment that we like. We can't be just for this and not for that. We can't. And, and listen, if you... If you can figure out the perfect candidate, please let me know because I can't, but I know, I know that there's certain things that I can't support. And, 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 and I believe as a Christian that when, when Jesus says, you can't come to me and say, what's the most important commandment? And then try to mix that into just being one kind of person. I think that's why Jesus responded to this question by saying, the first command is love God. But the second is love your neighbor, love your neighbor, love your neighbor, love your neighbor. We have to ask our questions, ourselves questions. Are we loving as many people as we possibly can? Not just one issue, not just one group, not just one type of person. Are we loving every neighbor, every kind of bird with a, with a intensity and a uh, that 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 their humanity matters. So I, I'm going to take you to, um, I want you to listen to this song. This is David Byrne. He's got a new show out on HBO called David Byrne's American Utopia. David Byrne was the lead man for the Talking Heads. Um, he, Spike Lee actually um, directed this, this uh, show. And uh, there's a song, he will explain it, but there's a song and the song's name is a question and it's called Hell You Talking About. And uh, he, will, he will explain this. So I'm gonna share my screen really quickly, hopefully, and try to maybe turn up your volume. I'll turn mine up and see if we can do this. But I, I want you to hear this and, uh, and, and listen to this and it impacted me when I watched it. I've seen it a couple of times and it's just, I think this is a great way to look at life right now, especially the question of what Jesus is saying. Hey. Question, hell am I talking about? What are we talking about when we're talking about lives? What are we talking about when we're talking about loving our neighbor? It's powerful when we see these types of displays because these people have names. It was powerful I, I, when they were singing. I don't know if you picked up on the last time that they would say, say his name or say her name. They would ask a question, won't you say her name? The question to us, is are we willing to say the names 
of all people that are hurting. That was a protest song. It was obviously against uh, racial kind of inequities, but there's that's just one example. It's an example of too many, too many, too many times, but it is just one example of people who are being left out and who are not being cared for and who are not being loved. And the church cannot sit idly by and say, we have nothing to do with this. This is not our problem. So I leave you with that question. Hell, are we talking about? When we say love your neighbor as yourself, what does that mean? Are we willing to say the names? Are we willing to love our neighbor? That's the question I leave you with. I don't know what the answer is for you, particularly this moment. I don't know necessarily what the answer is even for our community uh, at this particular moment. I would like to think that we are many people here who care deeply. And I do believe that. But I also think that we are all imperfect in our own actions and in our own faith and in our own lives. And so what I would encourage you to do is take that question and take that protest song and let it become a question that stretches you. What am I really talking about when I say I love Jesus I follow Jesus, and I'm, I'm trying to do the way of Jesus in this world. So what does that mean? Are we willing to say the names of people who are crying out and who are hurting? That's my thought for you today. That's what I leave with you today. And I pray, I pray that all of us, I loved what David said at the beginning, not just that we can make change out there in the world, but that I might change. That's a question that all of us have to ask ourselves. Amen? Am I willing to make the change? Is there any area in my life that I need to change when it comes to loving my neighbor? And if there is, then gosh darn it, I'm going to get after it and let the Holy Spirit help me. Amen. Thank you, God, for your body and your blood of, this, of your son that was given for us to restore us, to reconcile us, and to change us forever. May we now become agents of change in the world where we change from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. So offering today, kind of on top of what was, or looking at what Israel was saying, <clears throat> when I've been doing my uh, reading and educating myself on the different um, marginalized groups and trying to understand more about who I am in this world versus who others are in this world. Um, I have a lot of people that tend to bring up the people who have died. They tend to bring up their the negatives about their situations. They talk about justifying their death and they don't say it that boldly, but they argue that um, the people are on drugs or the people live bad lives or the people made mistakes that warranted their situation. Um, and I think about when I hear that, I put myself in a position to think if my life ended in the worst time that I was living, in a time when I made one of my most dreadful, embarrassing mistakes, and my life ended at that point, would that be who I am? And it's not. I'm much more complicated than that in a good way. There are many things I do that are um, positive and loving and giving. And we think about our children and the mistakes they make out in this world and of what if they made a decision and in that moment their life ended and that became public. Would that be who our children were, our spouses were? And I don't think it is. So I think it's important that when we are looking at people who have died and there are circumstances surrounding it that don't necessarily show that person in a positive light, that we realize that's a moment, not um, a lifetime. Um, and that's been something that's been important for me to uh, put in perspective. So I appreciate Israel showing these things. 
it's emotional for me to see those faces and know that that's somebody's child or husband or brother sister, and they know that person's life. They know their story, their circumstance. Um, and it's important to remember that it's not just a face or a name, it's more than that. So when we speak their name, we're speaking their life. Uh, thank you to all that give. Thank you that you, thank you to those of you who give in um, financial ways and in your time. I say this all the time, but it's all we have right now. <laughs> We're in such a weird state in our lives that um, all I can do is say thank you for continuing to give so that we can get through this and come back and meet again at some point and be okay. We're going to make through, I, I am convinced we're going to make it through this, but it takes all of us giving, um, I say a little, but really a lot. There are a lot of sacrifices needing to be made right now. So I thank you all. I thank you for your lives. I thank you for the positive you offer and that you give and your open-mindedness to uh, go on this journey of figuring it out. So love you guys. Pray with me, please. Holy God, thank you for this day. And God, I ask that those names that were mentioned in that song, um, stamp those into our hearts. And God, I ask for a, uh, a renewal a renewal in this country and a renewal within ourselves to um, to continue to challenge the way that uh, the system works and the way that we acquiesce to the system all too often. God, let us be interruptions. Let us be holy interruptions to empire. And God, let us be interruptions to uh, to our own way of doing things. Let us continually challenge ourselves to circumvent the ways of death and be people who promote ways of life and living. God, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.